Okay, we're going to go through the 2021 AP Chemistry FRQ question number two. Now this says answer the following questions about silicon and some of its compounds. So A, the mass spectrum of a pure sample of silicon is shown below. So a mass spectrum shows the various isotopes of silicon. So there's isotope of uh, silicon that weighs 28. There's a little bit of 29, a little bit of 30. So in a sample of silicon, it's mostly 28 but also 29 and 20 and 30. How many protons and how many neutrons are in the nucleus of an atom of the most abundant isotope of silicon? So we're talking about 28. So down here, periodic table, here is silicon. And we can silicon is number 14. That means it has 14 protons. And because it weighs 28, that means it must also have 14 neutrons. And that's all we have to say for part A, AI, and that's worth one point. Now we want to write the ground state electron configuration for this. And again, here's silicon, and I like to use the periodic table as my guide. So I can see that it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. Now, back here, here's neon. Neon was the last uh, noble gas that was completely filled. So we could also write this as neon in brackets. That means all the electrons up to neon. And then 3s2, 3p2. And either of these will get full credit, either of those answers. Uh, and that's worth one point. OK, part B. Two compounds that contain silicon are SiO2 and SiH2. Now, hopefully, when you look at this, you say, OK, there, SiO2, I recognize that. That is a covalent network solid. There aren't very many covalent network solids, and SiO2 is one of the classic ones. And SiH4, that's just a simple little molecule, and it would be very similar to methane, which would be CH4. Carbon and silicon are in the same family. So at 161 Kelvin, SiH4 boils, but SiO2 remains a solid. So one boils, but the other remains a solid. Using principles of interparticle forces, explain the difference in their boiling points. So for SiO2, a covalent network solids mean each silicon and each oxygen are uh, linked together with covalent bonds. And covalent bonds are very, very strong. So that is going to be hard to disrupt. So that's why that's going to remain a solid. So the interparticle forces here are covalent bonds. And in SiH4, each molecule has some uh, covalent bonds holding it together. But what holds each SiH4 with the other SiH4s is going to be a very weak interaction, and that's going to be uh, London dispersion forces. So that's a weak intermolecular force. So the, uh, intermolecular, the covalent bonds are much stronger than the uh, uh, London dispersion forces, and that's why at 161 Kelvin, the SiH4 will boil, but the uh, SiO2 will remain a solid because the London dispersion forces are much weaker than covalent bonds. For part C, it says that high temperatures, the SiH4 decomposes to form solid silicon and hydrogen gas. So hydrogen gas, we know that that is H2 because it's diatomic, and solid silicon would just be Si. And we can see that. We have a little hint down here. Here's Si and here's H2. Write a balanced equation for this reaction. So there would be Si H4 turns into Si and H2. OK, but we have four hydrogens on the left side. We only have two on the right side. So this must be a 2 over here. So it would be a 1 to 1 to 2 ratio. Um, if we wanted to, we could put in that this is a gas and that this one is a solid and this is a gas. That is not really necessary. That The phases are not necessary for this equation. And doing this, we're going to get one point. Now on the one before, 
uh, we had letter B uh, talking about the two different intermolecular forces, identifying the inner particle forces, and saying that this one is much weaker. Okay, that earned us one point. Explain why, okay, a table of the absolute entropies of some substances given below. Explain why the absolute entropy of silicon is much less than that of hydrogen. And so we're going to say, well, silicon is a solid, whereas hydrogen here is a gas. And in any gas, the particles are much more dispersed. So matter is more dispersed in hydrogen than it is in the solid. And we can see that solid particles, they're not going to be moving uh, around from each other. They're just going to be staying in place and basically vibrating a little bit. Whereas in the gas particles, they can move all around. So we see that the, the gas is much more dispersed, and that's why it has a higher value for entropy, 131 in this case. So talking about all that, the dispersal of matter, that is worth one point. Now, calculate the value of the delta S for this reaction. So, we're going to use these terms that we're going to use these numbers. And the idea for uh, figuring out the delta S is going to be the sum of all the delta S's of the products minus the sum of the delta S's of the reactants. So, here's our equation again. So, silicon, and look it up on the table, silicon is 18 joules per mole Kelvin. Hydrogen is 131, but there's two moles of it, so 131. And that's all added together. So that is the sum of the delta S's of the products. And then it's going to say minus the, the SiH4. And that is 205. So if we do that math, we come up with a positive 75 joules per mole Kelvin. And that's our answer. And when we get that answer, that is worth one point. Okay, letter F. The reaction is thermodynamically favorable at all temperatures. Explain why the reaction occurs only at high temperatures. So even though it's thermodynamically favorable, which means that the reaction is going to happen, it only happens a little bit, you know, until you get it at high temperatures. And we can see what's going to happen here is we have silicon uh, with four hydrogens. And in order to get to the products, it's probably a large activation energy. So the reason that E sub A, the reason that uh, the reaction only occurs at high temperatures is that we need to overcome the activation energy for this reaction. We said before SiH4 is silicon and it is bonded with covalent bonds to the hydrogens. So that's going to take a lot of energy to break up those covalent bonds in order to get this reaction started. Get to that description, that is worth one point. Now, a partial photoelectron spectrum of pure silicon is shown below. On the spectrum, draw the missing peak that corresponds to the electrons in the 3p sublevel. Now, you probably already know that if you look at a, uh, a photoelectron spectrum, that these peaks correspond to the um, electron configuration. So we could look at this one, say this is the 1s2. These are electrons from the 1s2 level. These are 2s2. These are the ones from the 2p6. And because it's the much higher, because there are six electrons in the 2p, then we get back here to 3s2. So we need one for the 3p2. So the uh, electrons are going to be at a higher energy. And there's only two of them in there. So our answer is to put another peak to the right of the 3s2 peak and it should be two things tall to a uh, relative number because it has a 2 in there. So we want to have a peak that's to the right and about two things tall. And if we do that, we get one more point. We've earned one more point. Now, using principles of atomic structure, explain why the first ionization energy of germanium is 
uh, lower than that of silicon. Now looking at the periodic table, I can see that germanium and silicon are in the same family. Okay, in fact, one is bigger than the other. I mean, the one is right below the other. And so if I look at silicon, we did its um, electron configuration. It was 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p2. Those were its valence electrons. And for germanium, it would be the same thing, except it's going to go off one more level. So its valence electrons are in the n equals 4 shell, and they're the 4s2, 4p2. So the difference here is that these uh, germanium, the, the valence electrons and the nucleus, okay, they are at a greater distance uh, because the germanium electrons are in a greater shell, higher shell, and so it has a larger average distance from the nucleus. And by Coulomb's law, that greater distance is going to have less attraction. And so therefore, the first ionization energy, the energy it takes to pull off uh, one of those outer electrons, is going to be lower. So the first ionization energy of germanium is lower because the electrons are in a higher shell, n equals 4 shell instead of an n equals 3 shell. And that's going to give it a larger average distance from the nucleus. And if you can see all that, that is worth one point. Okay, for part I, a single photon with a wavelength of 4.00 times 10 to the minus 7th meters is absorbed by the silicon sample. Calculate the energy of the photon in joules. So now this is a good time to go back and look at our uh, equation sheet. And on there under atomic structure, we can see that E equals H nu and that the speed of light is equal to uh, the frequency times the energy, now the wavelength times the frequency. Um, so I like to take this one and rearrange it so that I have nu, the frequency is equal to C over lambda. Then I can use that one and substitute into my E equals H nu. So I have this formula. So E equals HC over lambda. So the energy that I'm trying to figure out is equal to Planck's constant times the speed of light divided by the wavelength. Now on that equation sheet, we're also given these values. So it's just a matter of substituting. So I'm just going to take a moment and write all that in. all over the wavelength, which is 4.00 times 10 to the negative 7th meters. Now let's see if everything cancels out. Okay, so I have seconds and I have seconds to the minus 1, so that cancels out. I have meters on top, I have meters on bottom, so that cancels out. And I want my answer in joules, and I have joules left over. So now all I have to do is do the calculation. So I'll do that and be back in a moment. Okay, working this out, I get 4.97 times 10 to the minus 19th joules. And getting to that point is worth one point. So I just have to substitute into my equations, use the values from the uh, equation sheet, make sure I don't make any mistakes, and I get one point. That is question number two.